Welcome to our Mary Greeley Primetime Alive presentation, Arthritis, Causes, and Types. I am Vicki Newell, and I manage the Primetime Alive program here at Mary Greeley Medical Center. As a reminder, if you want to join Primetime Alive or sign up for any of our upcoming programs, you can go to mgmc.org slash PTA. Our presenter today is Dr. Melissa Wells. Dr. Wells received her Bachelor of Biochemistry, Cell, and Molecular Biology from Drake University and her medical degree from the University of Kansas School of Medicine. She completed a residency in internal medicine at Mayo Clinic and a rheumatology fellowship at Duke University. She joined McFarland Clinic Rheumatology in June of this year. Please welcome Dr. Wells. Thank you, Vicki, and thank you for having me here today. Um, today I'll be talking about different types of arthritis and their causes. I have no relevant financial disclosures other than I really like talking about rheumatology and I love my specialty. Um, the goal of this talk is to um, I, uh, go over some of the most common causes of arthritis and joint pain and why they occur. Arthritis is very common. According to the CDC, the most recent estimates uh, account for about one in four people or approximately 58.8 million people have a diagnosis of arthritis. These are people who have a doctor that's said they have arthritis, so these numbers might be higher if somebody doesn't have, uh, have, hasn't seen a doctor with that diagnosis. Um, going forward, just so you're aware, down here at the bottom in yellow is the site where uh, the information on the screen has come from. I do have some references at the end of the slide if you're looking for more information and want to know where to find it. So there are many different types of joint pain um, and causes to them. These are just some of the causes, um, and I'll be going over most of this. So osteoarthritis, degenerative disc disease of the spine, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, pseudogout. Then there's a group of arthritis called spondyloarthropathies that we'll talk about, which include things like psoriatic arthritis and ankylosing spondylitis. Um, then there's a group of other conditions that are autoimmune diseases. Um, we group them all together and call them connective tissue diseases, things that you might have heard of that fall under this category include systemic lupus erythematosus, Sjogren's syndrome, systemic sclerosis, sarcoidosis. Um, then there's some other more generalized pain conditions such as polymyalgia rheumatica, fibromyalgia. And then there's other things like genetics and infections, which I won't go into in this talk, but that can also lead to joint pain. So um, not many people know what a rheumatologist is, but uh, we are someone who specializes in the diagnosis and management of arthritis, as well as other disorders of the joints, muscles, and bones. Arthritis are part of what we do in our practice. Um, we also see things like vasculitis, and we help um, work to identify what's going on. So let's dive into some of these different causes of joint pain. First up is osteoarthritis. This is the most common form of arthritis. Um, the skeleton on this part of the screen, the areas in red highlight some of the most common places that you will see um, osteoarthritis develop. So you can see it in the hands, in the spine, including the neck and the lower back. The hip is also another common place where you can get arthritis, um, knees, and then again in the toes. There are a few different contributing factors to the development of osteoarthritis. This tends to occur with age. So often we start to see people develop arthritis and uh, osteoarthritis into their 50s and 60s. It can occur earlier, especially if you've had an injury. So some people might develop it in their 30s or 40s um, if they've had an injury to one of their joints. Overuse, so oftentimes people who are in um, labor-intensive jobs might develop osteoarthritis, um, especially into the knees and hips. That's a very common place as well as the spine in patients and, um, who've uh, overused their joints. 
obesity is another contributing factor. Um, part of what happens with obesity is extra weight adds stress onto the joints and can increase the risk of developing arth osteoarthritis. But then also the fat cells that make up the obesity are inflammatory and can lead to development of osteoarthritis. Musculoskeletal abnormalities, so sometimes people are born with deformities or changes in their joints that can predispose them to develop osteoarthritis. Weakness of muscles, so if your muscles don't adequately support a joint, this can lead to poor alignment and result in osteoarthritis. Genetics probably plays a role in osteoarthritis. It's not uncommon to have a family history of osteoarthritis. And then gender, women are more likely to experience, develop osteoarthritis than men. And then there's uh, environmental factors, such as somebody's occupation, level of physical activity, strength of their muscles, um, as well as bone density and diet. So some of the symptoms associated with osteoarthritis include things like pain with or aching during activity, after long activity, or at the end of the day. Joint stiffness can occur first thing in the morning or after rest, typically in the morning. Um, it's 30 minutes or less, but sometimes it can be longer. It's not uncommon for my patients to say after they've been sitting in a car for a while or watching a movie, they might get up and take a few minutes to get moving again. Sometimes people will experience a limited range of motion. Um, this can improve with activity depending upon the severity of arthritis. The more severe uh, the arthritis, the less the joint will move. Clicking or popping sounds when the joint bends. That's not uncommon to have some snap, crackling, and popping. Some people will get some swelling around their joints. It's more easily to see in a knee joint where the swelling tends to be located more on the top of the joint. And then weakness around the joint. Um, so over time, we do tend to lose muscle strength unless we're using our muscles. Um, and if you have a joint that hurts, sometimes it makes you less wanting to do activities that can improve your muscle strength. So there can be weakness around the joint. And then sometimes joints will be unstable or give out, such as a knee. Um, so it's not uncommon to experience that as well with osteoarthritis. So I like pictures. So there's going to be quite a few pictures of different types of arthritis and what they look like. Here is a picture of somebody's hand with osteoarthritis. Typically, in osteoarthritis of the hands, it's going to be more into the joints of your fingers. So here you start to see some deformity where the joint is starting to form nodules, and then the finger is starting to kind of curve a little bit. You can see an enlargement of the joint. And another common place is down here at the base of the thumb, which leads to some uh, squaring of the thumb joint. And then the thumb kind of takes this picture where it's extending out like this. This is that same person's hand x-ray um, and you can start to see how the joints become deformed. So you should see lots of nice neat uh, spaces in between the joints. The bones should be pretty symmetric and smooth. But as you can start to see here, we start to develop a little bit of osteophytes or bone spurring on the side of the joint. The joint space becomes narrowed. Um, you can see that specifically down here as well. These are the different stages of knee osteoarthritis. So knees are a very common place for this to occur. What's happening with the osteoarthritis is the surface of the joint or the cartilage depicted in this color, right? This light blue color along the, the thigh bone or the femur bone, and then the lower leg bone or the tibia is present right here. This will start to uh, become thinner and develop cracks in it, which is highlighted right here. Um, the joints will start to move closer together, and then you can see bone spurs forming. So that's what this uh, picture is starting to show, usually on the, the edges of the joints. 
Um, and then eventually the joints will start to touch and rub each other. In the knee, this is where your meniscus is supposed to sit right in here um, between the two bones and become a cushion. And if that becomes damaged because the joint is starting to be affected by osteoarthritis, that can lead to the clicking um, and locking of the joint with activity. All right, moving on to hip, which is another common place where we start to see osteoarthritis. On this side of the screen, this is a normal joint. Um, this is your pelvis bone or your hip bone. You can see part of the sacrum and the spine. And here's your, your leg bone. You'll see a nice joint pr preservation right in here. Um, but then as the arthritis starts to develop, that joint space starts to narrow, so you don't see that space anymore. And you start to see a spur develop on this side. You also see a spur down here, and that will prevent the joint from moving. You can also see degenerative arthritis of the spine, as well as degenerative disc disease. Um, so this is an image of a healthy spine, and you can see the bones are nice and symmetric, and here's where the, the disc space sits in between to provide cushion between the joints, uh, between the bones, and then the spinal cord comes down back here on this side of the spine, and nerves exit off um, to provide um, signals to your legs and arms on how to move and um, how to feel in like your hands and feet. Over time, if those discs become um, flattened or torn or start to pinch out, then eventually the the discs will the vertebra bodies will sit on top of each other, and you'll start to see development of osteoarthritis. So that's what this is starting to depict with uh, bone spurring and flattening of the disc or the degeneration. You can also start to develop facet arthritis. So this is a side view of a, a pictorial picture of your spine. Um, and this is what a healthy facet joint looks like where it the bottom vertebra is touching the upper vertebra. So you can see the cartilage um, is intact. There's some fluid in the joint to help allow for movement. And then there's a lining around the joint um, to protect it eventually over time. Um, and this joint is affected by uh, degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis of the spine. You'll see a loss of that cartilage. The space starts to disappear and there's less fluid in there. Um, and then, um, so if you've ever seen on some of your imaging reports the term spondylosis, um, this is a, the degeneration of the discs as well as um, the arthritis developing in the spine. Um, and then another term you might have seen if you've had any issues with your back is something called spondylothesis, which is where there's a slippage of the spine. So you start to see the vertebra move forward, um, which can cause some pinching of the spinal cord and then and sometimes this will even cause disruption of the facet joint. Um, typically with things like osteoarthritis, working with your doctor on management of pain um, can be helpful for this condition. Another common type of arthritis is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it's different it involves some of the similar areas as osteoarthritis, but a few different areas. So typically with rheumatoid arthritis, we don't see it in the lower part of the spine, but we will see it sometimes in the upper part of the neck, usually at the very top of the cervical spine. Um, it can involve the shoulders, um, elbows, which is not something we typically see in osteoarthritis unless there's been an injury, hands, which follows a slightly different pattern than um, osteoarthritis, knees, ankles, and feet. The causes of rheumatoid arthritis um, go back to how the immune system is functioning. So our immune system is designed to help protect us against infection and surveil the body for uh, cancers. However, sometimes the immune system starts to recognize tissue that's supposed to be there as um, foreign. So it starts to attack the tissues and rheumatoid arthritis one of the areas are the joints and the joint spaces themselves. Proposed triggers. We don't know exactly what causes uh, rheumatoid arthritis. There may be a genetic component as sometimes it runs in families and there have been a couple of genes that have been associated with rheumatoid arthritis. 
There is some thought as to whether or not this is hormonal. Um, women do tend to be more affected than men. Um, there tends to be um, development of rheumatoid arthritis either in the 20s and 30s, but then also again in the 50s and 60s. So there might be some changes in hormones that lead to development of rheumatoid arthritis. Then there's questions about things like the environment. So people who are smokers have a higher risk of getting something like rheumatoid arthritis. People with gum disease have been found to have a higher risk of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and of course, we're still looking into other causes of why rheumatoid arthritis develops. And then we're also kind of wondering if there's a combination. So maybe it's genetics that predispose and then you get exposed to something in the environment and that's what triggers a rheumatoid arthritis flare up. So what are some of the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis? So joint pain, tenderness, swelling, and stiffness. Generally, this is going to last more than six weeks. Um, so if, um, in this hand, this person has rheumatoid arthritis. In the hand, for somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, it tends to involve the knuckles along here and as well as these knuckles. You can see some swelling in this part of the hand as well as the um, this part of the index finger and the middle finger, but it tends to spare the knuckles that are more at, towards the fingernails. Morning stiffness is usually longer than something like osteoarthritis. It can last 30 minutes or longer. It's not uncommon for somebody to say they have a couple of hours of morning stiffness with rheumatoid arthritis. It's usually more than one affected joint. Um, so it, typically it's not just going to be one finger, it's going to be multiple fingers or a wrist or an elbow. Um, smaller joints such as the wrist and hands or feet are typically affected first and then it can move into some of the other joints, but not always. And this usually involves joint on the same side of the body. So typically somebody will have, um, like if their wrist is affected on their right, then typically the wrist on the left will also be affected. Rheumatoid arthritis is also what we consider a systemic condition, meaning that it affects more than one area of the body. Um, so these are some of the other areas in which we see rheumatoid arthritis involving. Um, so people with rheumatoid arthritis have a higher risk of stroke and heart attack. Um, the eyes can be involved um, and there can be inflammation, pain, redness, sensitivity to light that occur. Um, the mouth can also be involved, which isn't depicted on this, this picture, but you can get some dryness, gum inflammation or irritation. The skin can be affected and you can get development of rashes or nodules, which I'll show you a picture here in a little bit. The lungs can be involved, so you can develop um, inflammation or scarring in the lungs, which can make it harder to breathe. Blood vessels um, can be affected and you can get inflammation or vasculitis of the blood vessels, which can affect nerves, um, skin, or other organs. The blood itself can also be affected and people can have uh, anemia or low bl white blood cell counts. And then medications like glucocorticoids, um, which are commonly used in treatment of rheumatoid arthritis early, can lead to things like diabetes um, or osteoporosis, which is the thinning of the bones. So we make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis based off of symptoms. So going back to how people are feeling, which joints are involved what we see on exam. So looking for signs of swelling and tenderness or changes in how somebody can move their joints. And then we, we also use things like lab tests to help make the diagnosis. So there's a couple of different blood tests, the rheumatoid factor and the anti-CCP test that can be associated with rheumatoid arthritis. However, not everybody um, will have a positive um, rheumatoid factor and or CCP. And then we take into effect um, what their, their uh, joints look like on x-ray. So here's an x-ray of somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis. And as you can see from the arrows, these are arrows where the arthritis is involving. The arrows are pretty symmetric. So you can see a red arrow highlighting an erosion um, present on this joint. And then you can see that on the other side. 
Same thing with some joint space narrowing highlighted by the blue arrow. You can see it on the other side. You can see some thinning of the bones noted on the, the green, si green circle as well as on the other side. Um, and then you can see some crowding of the small joints of the wrist, um, which is also more commonly seen in something like rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis can involve the feet. So in this picture, um, this is somebody who has early rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you can see on the left foot here, swelling in the big toe as well as the little toes next to it. And then on the right foot, you can also see some swelling in these joints. It's a little bit subtle and hard to pick up on here, but that's why doing an exam can be so important with your doctor. And then as the arthritis starts to progress, you can start to see deformities in the, in the foot joint. So here we start to see where the toes are crossing, um, get a, a larger um, deformity of the big toe, and the big toe is leaning out to the side. Um, you get some um, what we call hammer toes, or where the joint starts to kind, of, the tendons start to tighten, and then the joints start to bend, and kind of looks a little bit like a hammer. Um, this can be very painful. It can also disrupt what types of footwear people will wear, um, and that can be uh, problematic. Um, this is another thing that you can see with rheumatoid arthritis. These are called rheumatoid nodules. Hands and elbows are a very common place for this to develop. So you can see these bumps that are starting to form. These look a little bit different than the bumps that you might see on somebody's hands who have osteoarthritis. And then you can also get it around your elbows as well. Rheumatoid arthritis is treated with medications that target the immune system, which is a little bit different than the osteoarthritis. So it's very important to work with your doctors on um, management of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, there's another group of arthritises that are can have similar symptoms to rheumatoid arthritis, and this is the group of spondyloarthropathies. Um, there's several different types of spondyloarthropathies that fall into this same class of, medic um, class of arthritis. So things like psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis tends to involve the spine, while psoriatic arthritis tends to involve um, joints into the hands, feet, um, knees, um, so out into your arms and legs. Reactive arthritis um, is when you develop the arthritis after an infection. Um, enteropathic means that the uh, gut is involved. Um, so these people have inflammatory bowel conditions like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, which can be associated with arthritis. Um, unfortunately, um, children can develop spondylarthropathies. And then if somebody's not fitting into like psoriatic arthritis or one of these other categories, then we call it undifferentiated spondyl arthropathy. So this is a picture of somebody who has psoriatic arthritis. So um, with psoriatic arthritis, you'll see, just like with rheumatoid, the swelling of the joints. So you can see some joint swelling here. Um, since it, there's uh, psori psoriatic arthritis is associated with psoriasis, so you can see some rash um, into the skin right here. You can see the nails are starting to um, become changed. Um, partly what you see is some pitting of the nails. The nails can be broken. Um, they can become thickened. Like Here's this person's normal nails, but you can see involvement in most of the nails of the left hand as well as the right. Um, this slide highlights some of the differences between ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, it also highlights that these conditions can cause other things besides arthritis. So fatigue or inflammation of the eyes um, can inv be involved in both conditions. Um, you tend to see just the skin involvement in psoriatic arthritis. Um, but you can see inflammatory bowel disease in both of these conditions. Um, nail changes um, tend to be more in something like psoriatic arthritis. And then there's another um, symptom that people can get, which is called enthesitis. The enthesome is where your muscles or tendons attach onto the side of the joint, and that can become irritated or inflamed. And then when that happens, we call it enthesitis. I'll show you a picture here coming up. So here's a um, 
x-ray of somebody who has um, spondylarthropathy of the joint. Um, and as you can tell from the yellow areas, these are pointing out where there's joint space narrowing or erosions. Um, unlike with rheumatoid arthritis, this can be, um, it's not usually symmetric, so you'll see more arrows on the left side of this person's hand rather than the right side. It can also involve the joints into the fingertips um, as well as down into the knuckles. So that's what kind of distinguishes it as well from something like osteoarthritis. Um, and you can start to see that the little finger on the left hand is more severely involved. And you can start to see that this person is having trouble straightening their joint and starting to get a little bit of a curve. And that's because the arthritis is involving not only um, the middle knuckle of the finger, but then also the one closer to the nail. So here's some other pictures of um, psoriatic arthritis. So in this top picture, picture A, you'll see a dactylitis, and that's where the entire toe, so this middle toe and then the little toe next to it, are both enlarged and swollen. Um, we also, people have referred to this as sausage digit. This occurs not with injury. So obviously you can have swelling of your entire finger if you like jam it or your toe, um, but this tends to occur without an injury. Um, so I was talking about where the tendons attach onto the joints or enthesitis. Um, this is a sign, uh, um, this is what that might look like on exam. So the Achilles tendon comes down and attaches onto the heel bone or calcaneus. Um, and this, this person has a normal left foot. Oops, sorry, hold on. Left foot, but then the right um, ankle, you can see there's some swelling here. This can be very tender and painful and make it hard to move or push up on your, your foot. Um, here we've got a picture of dactylitis um, in the middle, involving the middle finger, and here's another picture of how severe the damage from arthritis can be, where you see um, significant changes marked by the um, yellow arrows. This is a picture of somebody with ankylosing spondylitis over a series of 26 years. Um, what's happening with this is the back is starting to fuse, which I'll show you some closer pictures of that. Um, they'll start to see a straightening of the spine and eventually it'll cause the person to bend over. Um, this person did have a hip replacement um, around the time of this last picture, so that's why they're starting to stand up um, a little easier in the last picture. Um, this is unfortunately before the advent of some of our newer medications, but part of our treatment goal now is to try to prevent this from happening. So what's happening in the spine um, is that the um, there's starting to become inflammation where there is joints. So the facet joints that we talked about going back to the degenerative arthritis of the spine, those become, can become inflamed as well as the bottom of the vertebra. Um, and then eventually those can fuse um, and you can see in this picture, this is somebody who's had some fusion of the spine where the discs are preserved, so they don't have that pinching of the discs that are smishing out um, from a degenerative process. Um, but then they've got um, a fusion of the spine, which makes it harder to move, like what you saw in the other gentleman's picture. Another type of arthritis is gout. Um, this is a drawing back from 1799 of somebody's depiction of gout. Um, and if you've ever had gout, I don't know if you'd agree, but a lot of my patients um, have said that this is very, very painful. Um, and they feel like there's a little um, gremlin or dem demon attacking their joints. What's happening with gout is there is a deposition of uric acid crystals in the joint space. Um, and those look like little tiny needles. So if we took this person's foot and tried to pull fluid out of that joint and look at it underneath the microscope, um, you'll see these little needles, and those are the gout crystals that are in the joint. 
Um, so uric acid is a natural byproduct of the body, and, but sometimes people make too much of it or they can't get rid of it. Um, and if that happens, then you'll see the blood level of the uric acid go up and then it'll start to deposit in other areas. Typically, this involves the feet first, but it can migrate to other joints, as I'll show you here in a little bit. So here's some other pictures of um, people who have gout involvement in their feet. This top picture, um, you can see there's swelling of the big toe, redness. Um, this is probably very painful. Oftentimes, people have told me it feels like their foot is broken. They don't want it touched by sheets. Um, this can have a very sudden onset. And the pain can be very dramatic. Um, you can see the redness of the joint and swelling. Um, you can see the swelling in this person's foot as well in this bottom picture. You can see it around the big toe on both sides. So here's some swelling. Um, and then you see some um, other bumps that have formed on the foot. Um, those are likely tophi, which are deposits of um, the crystals that are clumping together. Um, some people notice that they have triggers. So oftentimes what we eat in our diet, it can raise our uric acid levels. So some people will notice if they eat red meats, um, like hamburger or steak, um, shellfish can cause this to happen. Um, foods that are high in fructose corn syrup can trigger things like gout attack and alcohol can also trigger gout attacks. So sometimes people will say, oh, I had a steak dinner and had some beer last night and now I have a gout attack. Um, and that can certainly happen. Here are some other pictures of those gouty deposits called tophi. So over time, as the uric acid levels are building up in the body, they'll start to deposit in other areas. So these are those crystals that can develop into the fingertips, which can be very painful. Sometimes they can even open up, and then the elbows. Um, typically, we'll see the uric acid level be elevated in somebody's blood for about 10 years before they start to have their first gout attack. Now, what does that look like on x-ray? So I have a few different examples of that. So this is a person that had um, swelling of the foot, um, and then um, investigators, this was done at Mayo Clinic, um, were trying to figure out what was going on with the swelling. So they did a specialized test called a dual energy CT scan to try to help them figure out what's going on. So this is a 3D um, rendering of that CT scan, um, which shows um, that the purple right here, that's dense bone or cortical bone, but then everywhere you see the green spot, that is gout cr crystals or uric acid crystals that have deposited into the joint. So that area where the joint was really large on this person's great toe is gout crystals. But one of the things I wanted to highlight on this is that it doesn't just have to be in the great toe. The gout crystals can deposit throughout the foot. So you can see into the person's midfoot, you can start to see gout crystals everywhere there's this green. That's where the crystals are developing. Now, this is a specialized CT scan, and we don't have it everywhere. So if you're interested in something like this, you need to work with your doctor to find a place that will do this te specialized test. Um, Gout can be very destructive. So the longer that you have all those crystals into the joint, the more damage that it can occur. So this is a picture of somebody's feet who has significant gout. And you can again see a large spot off of the right great toe. This is probably a tophus. There's probably another one up here. They might have a little bit of swelling with it. And then you can see where the bones are starting to touch each other. And then you can start to see kind of cutouts of the bone, um, and that's damage from the gout crystals. So you can see that kind of up into the toes, um, especially on the, the first and second toes on both feet. And then over time, you can start to get it into the hands. Um, and this is a person who's severely affected by gout. Um, you can see there's large swelling of the soft tissues. This person's finger um, has had a, a lot of... Um, damage to the joint already. Um, treatment can help get rid of the tophi and prevent flare-ups, but some of, once the damage has occurred, um, we can't get those joint spaces back. 
there's another mimicker of gout, something called pseudogout or CPPD. So the most definitive way to test for crystals um, and see what's in the joint is to pull the fluid out. But on these patients, you're not going to see those needle-like crystals developing into the joint. You're going to see these crystals. Um, and this is a deposition of a calcium crystal called calcium pyro pyrophosphate dihydrate, or CPPD for short, and they're more square-shaped. Um, so pseudogout will also have sudden onset of pain, swelling, um, decreased range of motion in the joint. However, it's more likely to occur in the hands first. So this is a person, um, you're seeing both of their hands, and you can see that the, the right hand is more severely swollen than the left hand. You can see the loss of the knuckles. Um, this person is having a, a pseudogout or CPPD flare-up. Um, Sometimes CPPD can be a little bit hard to diagnose, but we can see some tall tale signs on x-rays. So the spots where these arrows are and in pointing into the joint space, you can see there's a little bit more white uh, where there should be a darker space. And that's calcium that's building up in this knee joint as well as this wrist joint. There's some calcium deposits. Um, CPPD is more likely, or the calcium crystals are more likely to develop into the joints with time, so we're more likely to see this in older individuals. Um, some people have genetic predisposition to having crystals build up into their blood. Um, if they take too much calcium in their diet, you can certainly see that, um, or if they have too much iron. Um, so you can start to see there's some calcium build off up off of the middle knuckles right here on that person's hand x-rays. And this is an ultrasound rendition. Um, there's another type of pain that you can experience, which is called polymyalgia rheumatica. We don't really know what causes it, but it's an inflammatory condition that occurs after the age of 50. There's been suggestions that maybe there's a genetic component or an environmental component, such as infection, that triggers this inflammatory condition to occur. It's typically hallmarked by a sudden onset in pain, stiffness. It can be associated with things like fatigue or fevers or feeling feverish. People might even experience some poor appetite or weight loss because of the inflammation. And then it tends to involve into the shoulders and neck. So people will often wake up and they'll have a lot of stiffness and have trouble putting on their shirts or down into their um, hips, um, hip area or lower back, um, and they might have trouble walking. So typically this is somebody who's um, over the age of 50 who wakes up. They've got this sudden onset of pain and stiffness. Um, their doctor might check their blood and see that they have extra inflammation in their blood. Um, and if there's no other causes, then this might be what's going on. Fibromyalgia is another um, pain condition that can cause some significant joint pain. We don't really know what's going on um, or causing the fibromyalgia to occur. Um, there have been some suggestions of having a triggering event to cause the fibromyalgia to develop, and this can occur um, at any age. Patients will have widespread pain, um, and this can be associated with other symptoms, including things like fatigue, difficulty sleeping, um, or difficulty with thinking. But it can also involve other areas. So oftentimes people will have joint pain or stiffness, especially when they wake up. Um, these little red dots point out um, tender spots that can occur within the body. And it tends to involve not only the right side and the left side, but it can, it can be both of them. Sometimes people will have more severe pain on one side than the other. Um, it tends to involve the chest as well as the back. Um, Sometimes people will have stomach issues, so nausea, irritable bowel syndrome can certainly occur. Um, urinary symptoms or pain um, um, in the pelvis can occur. Um, people have difficulty with memory. Some people will describe it as having brain fog. Um, so um, this is something to think about. It does not tend to um, cause joint pain, but it can overlap other things like osteoarthritis or chronic back pain. Um, 
Some of the other conditions that can cause joint pain um, are those connective tissue diseases um, that I pointed out, systemic lupus erythematosus or lupus or SLE um, is a, a cause of joint pain. You can see in this person, you'll start to, um, this person has some deformities of their hands. This is uh, something called Jacquot's arthropathy. It doesn't cause damage, um, as you can see in the arthritis, and it can be reversible and doesn't cause erosions. But lupus involves multiple areas of the body. It can involve the eyes, lungs, heart, kidneys. It can cause changes in blood counts, um, and it can also cause rash. This does tend to involve... Um, younger people. So typically we'll start to see um, lupus develop in people in their 20s or 30s. Women are more commonly affected than men. Sjogren's syndrome is another condition that can cause some joint pain. Sjogren's syndrome is an autoimmune disease where the immune system is starting to attack various parts of the body. The hallmarks of something like Sjogren's is going to be dry eyes and dry mouth because the immune system is attacking the glands um, in the eyes as well as the mouth and causing um, dryness to occur. But joint pain can also occur with this condition. Um, sometimes it's associated with things like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that's important to work with your doctor on diagnosis of these conditions. Um, Sjogren's does tend to develop in people's 50s and 60s. Um, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma is a condition that can cause some joint pain and muscle pain in people, um, but it also involves other areas of the body as well. These are some pictures of progression of involvement in the hands. So people might start off with having some color changes in their fingers, then their fingers might start to look a little bit puffy. Um, the skin will start to tighten and thicken um, so that it makes it harder to bend and move the hand, which is happening in these um, pictures B, C, and D. Unfortunately, um, some people can have more than one type of arthritis. Um, this is often where um, I'm called to help out with the diagnosis of the arthritis because sometimes people will have rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis or gout and osteoarthritis. And helping to identify what's causing the joint pain can be very important for treating the pain. So trying to figure out where it's coming from, and then our treatment varies from where, where the pain is coming from, and then please work with your doctor on diagnosis. Um, oftentimes when I'm talking about things like osteoarthritis, people will bring up osteoporosis. So I just wanted to clarify what that term means. So osteoarthritis is an arthritis of the joint, but osteoporosis is a thinning of the bones. It's not an arthritis. The joint itself tends to be spared. Um, just like osteoarthritis, osteoporosis can develop with time and age you'll start to see a thinning of the bones. So here's a more um, like a cross section of a leg bone. Um, you'll see some spaces in between the bones, but then over time what happens is those spaces start to get larger and larger, um, which makes the bone more brittle and increases the risk of fracture. Most people don't know that they have osteoporosis in, unless they break something and they do a test to screen for osteoporosis. Um, so if you are concerned that you might have something like that, it would be a good idea to talk to your um, doctor about um, testing for something like osteoporosis. And then if you're interested in finding out more information about what I've talked about, I included some um, key places where you can find information and read a little bit further. Um, and now we'll take questions. All right. Okay, are there any foods I should avoid with osteoarthritis? Great question. Um, diet and arthritis is a very hot topic right now. Um, we're still learning a lot about it. We, I don't have any specific recommendations for something like osteoarthritis, um, but there are some people who notice I feel better if I avoid food X. If you figure out or find, identify a food that you can avoid that affects your joint pain and you can avoid it, great. Um, if not, I do encourage healthy diet. With osteoarthritis, maintaining a healthy weight can be very important.
Looks like somebody lost sound, so I apologize to whoever lost sound. Does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, uh, let's see. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Wells. Great presentation. Lots covered. So thank you very much. Um, it sounds like a little bit of the screen got covered up. Now, everybody should have copies of the handouts as well that would show the full slides. So if you missed that, you could um, maybe reference those slides. Um, and we also did record this, and we'll send out the recording as well. Um, Want to remind everybody, we have a couple programs coming up in December. We have Wednesday, December 8th, um, when the holidays aren't fun. And that's going to be Mike Willer. He's our one of our bereavement coordinators here with Mary Greeley Hospice. And then Wednesday, December 15th, we have um, Dr. Christy Christofferson with McFarland Clinic Foot and Ankle Surgery is doing a program, Foot and Ankle Pearls from an Orthopedist Perspective. So once again, thank you for joining us all today. Thank you, Dr. Wells, and have a great day.